So our first speaker this evening, uh, Thomas Farrell, is someone who many of you will remember quite fondly from his days as a Maud DC board member, frequent walk leader, and the author of the wonderful Fungus Fact Friday website. <clears throat> Since that time, Thomas has gone on to pursue a professional degree at the University of Wisconsin. And tonight we're going to hear about his research on, um, on enoki mushrooms. If you're not aware, enoki or uh, nokitake is the Japanese name for Flamulina volutipes, a species you can find on your walks here. And a mushroom is just starting to appear now because of its fondness for cold weather and will become more common over the next couple of months. Of course, you don't need to go find them on a walk. Uh, all the Asian grocer grocers in the DC area sell enoki on a cheap. And while the domesticated version has little flavor, they're long regarded as one of the best medicinal mushrooms. It may help to fight cancer. It may help to lower LDL cholesterol. They may help improve cognitive function. Win, win, and win. But that's enough of me talking about enokitake mushrooms. Let's hear what Thomas has to say. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to a Ma DC friend, Thomas Rail. Unmute, Thomas. Thank you. And just reminded me. So, okay. Starting from the beginning. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Um, it's great to be back at a Mod DC meeting again, even if it is virtually this time. Um, and yeah, having to unmute yourself is a bit of a hassle, but I'm happy to be back in the club that kind of got me started. So my presentation isn't going to be much about the medicinal qualities or it has a little bit of cultivation, but what I'm focusing on with my research and in this presentation is mushroom development. So I'm going to be using enoki mushrooms to figure out what makes mushrooms grow. Um, oh, yes, let me get a pointer up here. There we go. All right. And I'm going to. Oops. Okay, now I can see my whole slide, great. So this presentation is kind of a shortened version of the one I gave at Sequinota. So we're gonna have a bit of an introduction first and then go into the main topic of mushroom development. I'll introduce Flamulina volutipes and then tell you about how I'm using it in my own research before wrapping things up with a few things that I would like you to take away from this presentation. So first about me, I was a member of MA, and so I consider myself a mycologist. Uh, I'm particularly a cell biologist because of the kinds of ways I like to ask questions. Um, I'm also a mushroom hunter, and as Tom mentioned, I'm a writer, I have a blog, and I'll have a link to that at the end of this presentation. Um, I was newsletter editor at MA for a few years before leaving to go get a master's degree at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And that's where I am now. I'm almost done with that. And I'll get into a little bit more about where I am exactly at the end of the presentation. Okay, first thing we have to talk about before we really get any further are fungal cells. A lot of you are probably familiar with fungal cells, but in case you're not, the basic unit of the fungus is called a hypha. And a hypha is just a cylindrical chain of fungal cells. And hyphae can branch and fuse with one another to make networks of cells called a mycelium. Hyphae are kind of weird because although I've drawn them as separate little cells with these lines, if we zoom in on one of those uh, lines, it's a structure called a septum. And if you'll see in this diagram, the septum has a big hole in the middle. So that means that the contents of one cell can just kind of move into another cell. So there's not really any distinction between the separate cells along a hypha. They're all kind of linked together very closely. So our definition of cell is kind of loose in fungi and that makes them behave in some really weird 
ways. Um, with that background, uh, I'm now going to move into mushroom development, which is our main topic for today. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about mushroom development, but what we do know can be summarized in the following uh, diagram of typical mushroom development. The first thing that happens when mushrooms start forming is that a fruit body initial appears. And this is just a loose ball of hyphae. It serves as the basis for the rest of mushroom formation, but is not very organized of, um, on its own. Next thing that happens is that more hyphae start growing into the fruit body initial, it becomes denser, and then tissues start to appear. Once the tissues appear, we call that structure a primordium. And by the end of the primordium stage, all of the tissues in the mushroom have already been established. Because those tissues are already there, all that's left to do is expand it and make the whole mushroom bigger. So typically the stipe elongates first, followed by the pileus, and lastly, the gills expand. So there's two basic processes going on here. First, all the tissues form in the primordium. And second, all the tissues expand like a balloon. And because it's such a simple process of forming tissues and then expanding, that allows mushrooms to pop up seemingly overnight. I have a video of the second part of this process, mushrooms expanding in action. This is a time-lapse video I took over about 11 hours after I got through with one of the jars for my research project. So these are flamulina mushrooms growing. So the main thing you see here is that the stipes are getting longer for these mushrooms. But if you had the um, high definition version of this video, I don't think you can see it over the Zoom link, there's little hairs along the outside of the stipe. And if you track those hairs, the ones at the top stay near the top of the stipe, the ones in the middle stay near the middle of the stipe, and the ones at the bottom stay near the bottom of the stipe. So even though the stipe is getting longer, we're not adding new tissue to the top or the bottom we're actually expanding the cells all the, along the stipe to make the whole thing larger. So it's really inflating like one of those um, long balloons you use to tie balloon animals. Uh, if you take one of those long balloons initially, it's a small cylinder, you blow it up, it becomes a big cylinder. But anything you um, attach to the top will kind of stay near the top the bottom stays near the bottom, the whole structure just expanded to get bigger. If you uh, have seen the movie Fantastic Fungi, there's some really good examples of this occurring. So next time you watch it, pay particular attention to the Amanita mushrooms with the dots on the cap, as well as some of the inky caps that also have little fibers on the top. You'll notice the same pattern happens. The um, cap starts off and all the, uh, the patches are evenly spaced on the cap. And as the cap expands, at the end of the expansion, all the little pieces still remain evenly spaced. So again, that's demonstrating that the cap is expanding and we're not adding any new tissue to the sides or the middle anywhere. However, this model of forming tissues and then inflating like a balloon has one major limitation. It was created using research into only gilled mushrooms. So that means it applies to gilled mushrooms and it might not apply to any of the other diverse forms that fungi take. And in fact, there's good reason to think that it does not apply elsewhere. And that's because mycologists consider there to be two different types of mushroom development. The first is called indeterminate growth, which you can recognize when mushrooms push each other out of the way and push aside debris. You see this often in gilled mushrooms and in this picture on the left here, you see two agaricus species that have 
uh, bumped up to each other, but um, the left one has kind of got shoved off to the side, which you can tell because the stipe is coming out of the side of the mushroom. So this is just like if you expand, if you blew up two balloons right next to each other, they would push each other off to the side. So this type of growth works for our model. Our other type of growth, indeterminate growth, does things a little bit differently. When two mushrooms using indeterminate growth meet, they will fuse with one another. And if they encounter an obstacle or debris, they will grow around the obstacle or incorporate debris into their fruiting bodies. You see this a lot in polypores. So this example I have on the right here is Latiparus persicinus. You can see it started out as two separate mushrooms, one that started here and the other that started here. And as they got bigger, they touched, fused together, and I actually uh, pulled up this mushroom and it had two different stipes, but where they met in the middle, you could not tell where one mushrooms ended and the other began. So they fused to become one enormous mushroom. The process of growing around obstacles and incorporating debris actually has an, its own specific term, and that is haptomorphosis. And I have a great example of this with Phaeolus schweinitzii. And I'm gonna zoom in on this mushroom in a couple places. So first on the left, we have this pine needle that fell on top of the mushroom. And as you can see in the middle here, the mushroom has started to grow around the pine needle. And eventually this will continue and the whole mushroom will end up completely, the whole pine needle will end up completely inside the mushroom. On the other side of the mushroom, we have, um, it started off growing and then encountered a couple of grass blades. And then it grew right around the grass blades and kept on going. And now the grass is kind of growing straight through the mushroom. So these are both examples of haptomorphosis. And if you imagine trying to recreate this with a balloon, there's no way for you to put up something on top of a balloon and blow it up and have that thing end up inside the balloon. It's just not possible. So it doesn't really fit our basic mushroom development model. Of course, even when we divide development into two different types of growth, that doesn't work in all cases. Uh, boletes are a good example of this. And here I have an example of boletes. If you look at the two mushrooms in the middle, you'll see that their caps are fused together. That's a characteristic of indeterminate growth. On the right-hand side, however, if you look around the base of the mushroom, you'll see it's actually pushed aside debris as it grew up through the mulch. And pushing aside debris is a characteristic of determinate growth. So what is this bolete doing? Is it doing indeterminate or determinate growth? I don't know. I think it uh, probably will end up being in its own separate category for types of growth, but nobody's studied this. Um, largely because we can't grow boletes in the lab. Uh, so it'd be great to study, just rather difficult. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to assume that our typical mushroom development model uh, is applicable. So we start off with a fruit body initial, get a primordium, and then inflate all the tissues. And I can assume that's correct because my study organism is Flamulina volutopes, which is in fact a gilled mushroom. So the model should apply. In case you're not familiar with this species, Flamulina volutopes um, can be identified in the wild by its slimy orange pileus, the attached pale yellow gills that leave a white spore print, the black velvety stipe, its clustered growth, and its growth on hardwood. So this is what it looks like in the wild, but as Tom mentioned earlier, it looks very different if you get it in the grocery stores. Instead of that nice umbrella shape with bold colors, you get kind of a spaghetti-like form. Tiny pileus, really long stipe, and all the surfaces are kind of a pale yellow. So when um, enoki mushrooms are cultivated, they are typically grown in bottles with a mixture of sawdust and grain in them. And to specifically get that spaghetti-like form, you have to add a collar on top of the bottle. 
Now this collar does two different things. First, it raises the concentration of carbon dioxide around the mushrooms. And second, it lowers the amount of light that reaches the mushrooms. Those two um, uh, features trigger the mushrooms to grow in this spaghetti-like format. So if you're lucky, which I have not been this lucky so far, but if you're lucky, you can find this growth form in the wild. So I got this picture on the right from somebody in the Western Pennsylvania Club, and they took this on their property coming out of a, a downed elm tree. On the left side of this picture, you can see we have our normal wild type forms. On the right side though, we have at the bottom are cultivated forms. So really long stipe, pale colors. And at the top right, we kind of have an intermediate form. So what's going on here? Well, the mushrooms on the right were actually covered up by bark. So bark, just like the collar that you put around the bottle when cultivated, tends to trap carbon dioxide and of course blocks light. So those two conditions, high carbon dioxide and low light, are also found underneath bark. And flamulina doesn't want to grow under bark because it wants to release its spores into the air so they can blow away. You can't do that under bark. So this cultivated form is actually a adaptation that allows the mushrooms to conserve energy until they have access to fresh air. So the mushrooms started growing way down at the bottom of this picture. They found they were under bark, so they grew really tall, really fast. And that's why they end up with a long stipe and a small pileus. Once they reached the edge of that bark, however, they switched their growth mode to grow in that um, colorful umbrella shape. And that's when this pileus starts expanding and we develop the vivid colors we expect from the mushroom. For my research, I'm using that difference in morphology to try and figure out what makes mushrooms grow from an inside the cell standpoint. Before I get too much, too much further into that, I have to tell you a little bit about some basic biology. Hopefully you remember from high school biology that all of the information your cells need in order to grow is stored on genes in your DNA which is found inside the cell's nucleus. That is the lighter circle in this diagram. The darker blue in the diagram is the rest of the cell, which is the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is where all of the stuff in the cell gets done. So information is stored in the nucleus, but all the work is carried out in the cytoplasm. So that presents DNA with a problem because it can't leave the nucleus. So in order for DNA to get any instructions out to the cytoplasm, it has to rely on a second molecule. And that molecule is called mRNA. M the M in mRNA stands for messenger. So this molecule's primary role is to carry messages from the nucleus to the rest of the cell. So mRNA copies down instructions from DNA, moves out into the cytoplasm, and then it attaches to a ribosome, which reads the instructions and builds an amino acid chain, which is then folded to become a protein. And proteins are the molecules that do all the work in a cell. So in this sequence of events, what I'm most interested in for my research is this mRNA part. You can sequence mRNA, like you can sequence DNA, um, which means that you can actually take specific tissues and read all of the messages that are being sent out from the nucleus. And that's important because cells can perform different functions by changing what messages they send out from the nucleus. And that's called gene expression. So whenever um, the a piece of mRNA is created and sent into the cytoplasm, we say that uh, gene, um, the instructions that it carried for that gene is expressed or activated. And that allows 
cells from one organism to make to become different from one another. So if you think about your brain cells versus your fat cells, they look very different and they carry out very different functions. And that even though they have the same exact DNA. And those differences are all a result of sending out different messages on mRNA from the nucleus. So I'm going to take advantage of this messaging system and figure out what makes different parts of the mushroom different from each other. To do that, the first thing I had to do was collect a sample from the wild. And this is the actual mushroom I collected. It's very beautiful. Next, I took a piece of it, threw it on a Petri dish. And once the Petri dish was full, I could then move on to the fruiting part of uh, cultivation. So the first step is to cut up the Petri dish into little pieces and add it to a jar of sterilized rye grain. You kind of shake the jar every few days to keep the rye grain loose and to mix it around to make sure that each grain of rye ends up with a nice fuzzy white coating of Flamulina volutipes mycelium. After that, you can take some of the uh, spawn that you just made and move it into the fruiting mixture jars. The fruiting mixture is made of a sterilized sawdust and rye grain. Mostly it's sawdust because Flamulina grows on hardwoods, so the sawdust is going to provide most of the nutrient requirements. The rye is just added to encourage mushroom formation because it provides an extra nitrogen source. Hopefully you'll end up with a nice polka dot pattern and then you let it grow. And once the jar is fully colonized, like you see on the right, you can transfer it to the fruiting chamber. This is the one I built in my apartment. It was my pandemic arts and crafts activity. And it has two important features. First, there is a white light coming from above. And that's important because Flamulina won't make fruit body initials unless it's exposed to light. So you need that light in order to trigger the early stages of mushroom formation. The second one, which you can't see, is that the jars are actually floating in an ice bath down here in this big box. And that one's important because Flamulina won't make mushrooms if the temperature goes above 60 degrees. So as the temperature gets cooler down at night uh, more recently, you'll start to see more of this mushroom appearing. So I used an ice bath because it was easy. I had a thermometer in there and I, every time it uh, got close to 60 degrees, I could just add ice cubes to reduce the temperature. Of course, you don't want light for the cultivated stage. So after the primordia formed, I added a uh, collar with a little cap on top to block the light for producing the jar, uh, the cultivated form in the jar assigned to that stage. Once I had some mushrooms, I could start sampling. And here's what that looks like. Um, these, are the these are the fruit body initials. I did not sample them because they are way too small, but you can see they're kind of these fuzzy, uncoordinated balls around these droplets of amber liquid. The first stage that I actually sampled was the primordial stage. And in Flamulina, they're actually triangular. And the tip of the triangle has a tiny little cap and gills on top of it. Next, I sampled the young mushrooms, which look very similar to the primordia, except that the stipe has begun to elongate. After that, I sampled the, excuse me, I sampled the cultivated form, which again, the stipe is very long, the cap and gills are still pretty small. And lastly, I took samples from the um, mature normal stage. And they were quite tall in my fruiting chamber, but uh, some of them did develop the fuzzy stipe. And of course, they all had the expanded pileus and well-developed gills. So I took samples from these ones that developed the fuzzy stipe. In all four of these stages, I sampled the mycelium beneath the fungus as a baseline, and then the stipe, pileus, and gills. Once I had each sample, I had to immediately freeze it in liquid nitrogen to preserve the mRNA. 
And then I could start the process of RNA-seq. And this is just a process that allows you to extract and sequence all the mRNA in a cell. First step of this process is to crush the sample. And then I used a couple kits to extract all of the RNA. And then I specifically took out the mRNA. Uh, there's other types of RNA in the cell that we don't want. It can just confuse things and not provide useful information. So once I had specifically the mRNA, I converted it to a cDNA copy. The C actually just stands for copy. So it's a reminder that your molecules are copies of the original mRNA molecules. And we did that because DNA is easier to work with and there's lots of sequencing technology available for DNA. So it's easier to just convert everything to DNA and work from there. Next, we had to add some bits to the cDNA called barcoded Illumina adapters and they allow you to figure out what sample each piece of DNA as cDNA came from. And then um, they also interface with the sequencing technology. Next, we do a few rounds of PCR to make some more copies to ensure we have enough to submit for sequencing. Whoops, wrong way. And then we submit it for sequencing and I use the Illumina platform. And that will give me a huge data file with lots of A's, T's, G's, and C's. As you can imagine, this is not readable by any human. So we have to use some computer programs to actually figure out what's going on in this, um, in each sample. So after we run it through the computer programs, we'll have a list of all the genes that are expressed in each different sample and uh, a number for how, uh, how much they are expressed. So after that, I will have detailed tissue level gene expression for all the different tissues, as well as the mature normal mushrooms, which gill tissue and the mature mushrooms have not been um, assessed before in flamulina for gene expression. I found that surprising um, because those are useful points of comparison, um, but it wasn't done. So my research will at least add something important to this field using flamulina. Since I have these extra pieces of information, I can do some interesting comparisons that haven't been done before, and hopefully that will enable me to identify gene expression patterns associated with specific tissues. In other words, what is the gill tissue doing that's different than the pileus tissue? And how is the pileus tissue different than the stipe and the mycelium and so on? Um, using all that information and comparing the cultivated and normal forms, as well as the different stages, hopefully I'll be able to identify some key development related genes. So where have I gotten so far? I've finished sampling and I've finished RNA-seq. This is what I submitted to the sequencing lab. This is all of my thesis research distilled down to one tiny little droplet of water with some DNA in it. I'm still waiting to hear back from the sequencing lab. Uh, hopefully this week is gonna be the week, fingers crossed. Um, and that's where I am so far. All right, so I talked about a lot of different topics in this presentation. So what should you remember from all of this? First of all, we have some cool research tools that allow us to do things like read all of the messages that cells are sending out of the nucleus. And that can um, allow us to figure out interesting questions like why, what makes the normal form of flamulina different from the cultivated form? I'd also like you to remember our basic model of mushroom development, where we start with a fruit body initial, we form uh, tissues in the primordium, and then we just inflate all of those tissues like you would a balloon. Of course, this model doesn't apply in all cases. It works well for determinate growth mushrooms, which you can recognize because they push aside nearby mushrooms and push aside debris. It does not work very well for indeterminate growth mushrooms which fuse with one another and engulf debris or grow around obstacles. And of course, there's so much variety to the fungal kingdom. 
I've been talking about guild mushrooms. I've included a couple polypores, but there's things like jelly fungi, earth stars, cup fungi that we have no idea what's going on um, from a developmental standpoint. That's one of the cool things about mycology. Um, basically, there's so much we don't know about everything. Uh, so people like you who have joined the club um, can make significant contributions to mycology just by going out on forays and looking for things that are around. You never know when you'll come across a weirdly formed mushroom and that could benefit us from learning about development or perhaps you'll find a new species. There's so many things. Um, so if you can get out on a foray um, and keep your eyes open. Okay, so I have a couple slides of references that I used for my presentation. I believe this will be posted online so you can actually go back and find some of these if you're interested. Of course, I know that this is not the best way to get you more information about this topic if you want it. So I have compiled a few blog posts onto my website about my thesis research and mushroom development. You can find them by following this link or scanning the QR code or going to my uh, blog, Fungus Fact Friday and finding the tag development. And that tag collects all those different resources together in one place. So if you want more uh, information about what I'm doing and about mushroom development in general, that is a good place to start. Another useful resource is Fungal Morphogenesis by David Moore. It was published in 1998, but is still the most complete resource we have on mushroom development. Hopefully somebody will write an updated version soon, um, but the field is kind of progressing slowly. So we'll see about that. I would be excited, but might not be a bestseller. <laughs> All right, um, I do have to thank some various people who have helped me with my thesis research. In particular today, I would like to uh, thank you all at the Mycological Association of Washington for helping fund my research. I could not have sampled as many mushrooms as I did, or as I could not have sequenced as many samples as I did without your support. So that has really benefited my research. Um, and I am very appreciative to all of you at MAW. Uh, 